So, we've been talking about kingdom. That's the only thing to talk is what I'm starting to learn and discover because as Jesus went, he preached the kingdom. And we got to present and preach the kingdom. We got to do what Jesus did. So, in order to understand um, the kingdom, why are we here, why God all did all this, we started right back in the beginning, right in Genesis. We're still there, we're in there, and uh, you can turn there if you want to. But again, when I ask you these questions, we have to get these points. I'm not just giving you a sermon. We've got to understand this is not just a message. Yeah. We've been programmed by religion to come to church, listen to the preacher preach, pat him on the back as we walk out and say, man, that was a good message, and then still go living like we don't know what the heck's going on. That's not what this is about. That's not what any of this is about. And we've been programmed to do that just to come to church, sit and listen. Church, it, it, it's not about church. This is a participation sport, amen? We are to be in the field playing the game. That's how God set it up. So in order to understand what this whole thing is about, we need to go back to the beginning and discover what God's purpose and intent was in the first place for making all this. And some people don't even know. Some people don't even know what was God's motivation behind everything He does. I've been saying this to you for four weeks now. Hopefully you get it. What is God's motivation behind everything He does? What is it? Love. love. God does nothing outside of love. So everything He has done is motivated and based in love. And love shares what it has. And it shares who it is. So we understood that. God shared what He had, which is what? A kingdom. And He shared who He is. His Spirit He put inside of us. Because He's Spirit. Everything He does is motivated from love. And then we understand what was His purpose in creating the earth. It was kingdom expansion. Amen? He wanted His invisible kingdom to be manifested in this visible realm. So we understand a kingdom has territory, it has land, the Adam make the earth. So it's his visible representation of his invisible kingdom. And then he created man. Why? Why did he create man? As his divine representative. Amen? And I want to read you this quote again. He created, man was created with a dominion mandate. A dominion mandate. And again, this is what dominion means. To be given dominion means to be established as a sovereign, kingly, ruler, master, governor, responsible for reigning over a designated territory with the inherent authority to represent and embody as a symbol the territory, resources, and all that constitute that kingdom over earth giving him responsibility for representing the kingdom government of God on earth. That's a mandate. You will have dominion over the earth. You will be my visible, kingly representative on the earth. So man was given a, a dominion mandate. Mankind is heaven's earthly agent for kingdom rulership influence. Mankind is intended to embody the nature of God on earth and serve as his divine representative in this physical realm. Once again, a quote from Miles. Last week we talked about why he made the garden. So he didn't know why he made the garden. What did he make the garden for? And again, the garden was an earthly outpost. That was man's headquarters. That's where he placed the man where? In the garden. He didn't place him in the middle of the ocean. He didn't place him up on a mountain. Placed him in a garden. That was to be man's headquarters from which he was to rule and have dominion over the earth. So basically, another quote, in short, as an outpost of heaven on earth, the garden colony of Eden displayed the culture of heaven. Now this is important. Culture is the combination of all these elements. Land, language, laws, constitution, moral codes, shared values, customs, and social norms. Culture defines a people. It is inherent. It comes naturally. 
which is exactly what God wants from His kingdom citizens. He doesn't want us to strive to obey laws written on stone tablets or laid down in books. He wants to write them in our minds and in our hearts so that they will become second nature to us. That way we don't have to think about living the kingdom culture. We simply do it. That's what it's about. Culture. Customs, norms, laws, rules. That's why we're getting so upset in this United States of America because other people are trying to redefine our culture and change language and change social norms that we have had. Now, cultures can evolve. There's nothing wrong with that. But for us, as kingdom citizens and understanding why God set this all up, we are not to deviate from His culture and His laws and His constitution. That's why, that's why He made all this. Because probably next week we're going to talk about the fall and why all that occurred and what happened. But this week, as I had someone say to me this morning, I'm glad you're preaching about this and not me. Why did He make woman? Why? Many have asked that question for centuries. Lord, the woman you gave me. Why, God, did you ever make women? And we're going to find out why. Because unless we understand, remember, if we don't understand the original design and purpose behind a thing, it is subject to abuse and misuse and misinterpretation. And that's what has happened. We've allowed culture and religion to define or redefine God's original intent. And it's no wonder women have gotten in an uproar. It's no wonder why men are now getting in an uproar. Culture's trying to redefine the role of men and women. So we've got to go back to the beginning to find out why God set all this up in the first place. What was the purpose behind all this so we can properly function as kingdom kids and properly function as the culture of heaven here on earth. Amen? All right, you ready? Here we go. Over in Genesis chapter 2. You can turn over there, follow me if you like. We're in the New Living Translation. I'm going to give you other little things. And again, you can always find the message on Dropbox and just follow along. But in Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 15, it says this, The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat of the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you will surely die. Okay, if you eat its fruit, you're going to die. Basically, if you disobey the law, here's the consequence of the law. And we talked about that last week. Because we talked about this part. Can I just interject right now? When God says, thou shalt not, da, 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 that means you shall not, and that's not open to interpretation. And if you do do that, there are consequences to that. Like when he says, thou shalt not commit adultery, there's consequences to that. Okay? Thou shalt not lie, there's consequences to that. We just flippantly have changed all that into what we want it to be and we got to understand right from the get-go, when he told Adam, don't do it, and Adam did it, what happened? He died. God's not a man that he should lie. God cannot just willy-nilly change his rules. He's the king. When the king speaks, it's done. It can't be changed. So we've got to really grasp that concept again, because in the culture in which we are in, we think breaking the law is cool. Don't we? I don't mean us, but it's gotten so radical that we think it's some badge of honor to go out and shoot police officers now because we don't agree with it. Whether you agree with it or not is irrelevant. You're breaking the law. We've got to get out of that mode of thinking that we have some input into it. God wrote it. That's it. It's not up for debate. Now, I've been taught that in a legalistic sense and that created rebellion in me, but now coming from a kingdom perspective and knowing His love and mercy and grace for me, knowing who He really is, I'm grateful for them because everything He does and everything He says is for my benefit. He only wants the best for me. 
He's not hindering me. He's not trying to bind me with some kind of burden. No, He's out to set me free. Freedom is walking in His laws, not doing whatever you think is right for you. You are not the best governing agent for your life. Amen? I've learned that now. I've lived a long time and I can look back and say, no, I was not the best governing agent for my life. God never designed human beings to live apart from Him and be independent. We have to be dependent upon Him. He's placed His Holy Spirit in us to guide and direct us in life. We must be always dependent on the Holy Spirit because when we do our own thing, we mess it up bad. And suffer consequences and then complain to God and say, oh God, why? Right? Now that must be for somebody because we'll get back here. Alright? Verse 18. Put the man in the garden and said, don't mess with that tree. If you do, you're going to die. What he said he? Verse 18. This is out of the voice translation. He said, it is not good for man to be alone. So I will create a companion for him. A perfectly suited partner. The expanded Bible, verse 18, says this. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper in the sense of a partner or ally. The word does not imply subordinate status. Who is right for, is suitable for, corresponds with him. Now let's look at that just for a second. Notice the first thing God said when he put him in the garden. This is what God said. It's not good for man to be alone. Now how many of us know that? How many of us know it's a dangerous thing to have an unsupervised man? Do not leave a man alone. You never know what will happen. And it's even worse when a group of men get together. And then if there's adult beverages involved, forget it. It's all undone. It's just chaos. We know that. Well, God knew that. It's not good to leave this guy alone. Okay? So we get that. That's the first thing we want to understand. It's not good for man to be alone. He says, I will make him a partner that is perfectly suited for him. One that corresponds with him. So understand, God's original intent of making a woman was to make an ally, a partner. A, a perfectly suited companion. We want to understand that. That's what God's intent was in creating a woman. I'm going to make a perfectly suited companion, partner, ally, not a subordinate. Okay? So that's what he says. Then he goes on. And he says so in verse 19. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. And he gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, all the wild animals, but there was still no helper just right for him. So Adam went through all this. Now notice, God brought the animals to him. Why? Why didn't the animals just walk up to Adam? Did I do this? I, I would really encourage you guys to think when you read Scripture. Ask why. God, why did you bring them up? And I believe it was a practical exercise of dominion over the earth. He just gave man dominion. Man's a living spirit right now. Adam's alive. You already breathed in him. Adam's alive. He's a human being, spirit being combination. Okay? He's there. So God brings the animals up to him. All right, son, what are you going to call that? Dog. All right? What are you going to call this? Cat. And he went through. I believe God was teaching man how to act as a king over his dominion. A king stands in his authority and demonstrates that authority by speaking. Right? And now what God did when he created? God said. And God said. And God said. Power and authority is in speaking, not so much doing. I believe that Adam spoke and he breathed life into each of those animals as God breathed into him. They became a living soul when Adam spoke. He didn't just give him a name, he gave him life. That's why God had to bring them to him. That's my thought. I mean, you can agree with 
with that or not, no big deal. I'm not going to haggle over that. But I think because it specifically said God brought them the animals. Well, if the animals were already alive and all they needed was names, why didn't they just walk up on their own? Well, why didn't he go to them? Or maybe God made each animal while Adam was standing right there and then asked him the name of So watch this, son. Form the bird out of the ground. What are you going to call this one? Form the cardinal out of the ground. What are you going to call this one? Cardinal. Maybe. Who knows? Interesting thought. But notice Adam did not find a suitable companion among all the animals for himself. So what did God do? Adam's there and he's looking at all this stuff God's making and he's naming it. He's like, hey, he's looking at himself. He's looking at all these things going by and he's like, hey, there's no one for me. Because I'm sure he understood the principle there was a male and a female and the animals were to be fruitful and multiply. He understood all this. Remember, he's already alive, living. So he understood that principle and he's like, hey, where's... There's no one for me. So Genesis... 221, this is out of the expanded Bible. It says, So God caused the man to sleep very deeply, a deep sleep to fall on Adam, man. And while he was asleep, God removed one of the man's ribs or side. Then God closed up the man's skin at a place where he took the rib or side. The Lord God used the rib or side from the man to make, build, construct a woman. And he brought the woman to the man. And the man said, Now this is someone whose bone came from my bones and whose body came from my body. At last, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. I will call her, or she shall be called woman. And then it gives a Hebrew thing. I can't say it. Because she was taken out of a man, in another word, in Hebrew. So let's notice this a second. The first thing God did was what? He knocked him out. That's God's method of anesthesia. You need any kind of drugs, any kind of stuff, just knock him out. And then if you look at that word, it means literally knocked out. I mean, there's some force behind this. He knocked him out. And he's down and out. And then what did he do? He removed the body part. He began to procure building material. And I just want to throw this out here, and I'm going to answer the question that I believe is the answer to it. Why didn't he just make her out of the dust of the ground like he made Adam? Why? He took the dust of the ground and four men, didn't he? Why didn't he do the same thing to make woman? But he did. He knocked him out and took out a hunk of meat. Bone and flesh. However we want to interpret that. He procured building materials, what we just read. Then he closed up the skin, so that was his recovery process. Just zipped it back up. And then he took and built a suitable companion. But in, in this process, I was just thinking about, you know what? Why do we have a hard time believing God to fix the problems that are in our bodies now when he did this then? He knocked the guy out, took out a hunk of his side, closed up the side, and he's back in business. Why don't we trust God to do the same thing whatever's going on in our body? You know what I mean? He showed us right at the beginning. Hey, I love and care about you so much. I can do this thing. Watch. And he did that. He did it. Why? Because everything he says is motivated by love. He only wants the best for you. Now, I certainly ain't going there. I ain't going down the medical community road right now. That's good. He took the rib and built a suitable companion. So again, why didn't he just form woman as he did Adam? From the dust of the ground. Adam was now a living, spirit-filled human being. Right? What God wanted to do is create another exact duplicate of that. He created the same thing. That's why he took building material from the man and made a woman. And then God brought the woman to the man. So I don't know where this was. I don't know if he was still knocked out. But at one point, Adam's there and he looks down and the hunk of his side's missing. And then there's a physical being standing in front of him. And at first, Adam identified her as being the very 
essence of who he was, body and fl flesh and bone. He recognized her for who, he was, who she was. And then the next thing is, he named her. Ain't that interesting? Just like the animals, God brought him woman. And if you read the text, it says, I shall call her a woman. Because she's bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. So could it be he spoke life into her? Is having dominion over the earth and speaking the breath of life into her? I don't know. Just a cool thought. But this is what happened, right? God took it out, brought her to him. He got really excited. Why? Because he saw the visible, another visible representation in essence, body and flesh of himself, which he didn't see in any of the animals, any of the fish, any, anything else, any of the birds. So I want to just share some thoughts about men and women, the relationship. Because in verse 24, if you read the next verse, it's interesting because it almost seems like it doesn't fit. Why is this here? What's Moses talking about? All of a sudden, when you look at verse 24, this is also why the expanded Bible, it says, So a man shall leave his father and mother in the sense of a new prime, primary loyalty and be united with his wife, and the two shall become one body, flesh. Just a couple thoughts here for guys. A man is to leave his family, both physically and emotionally, so that he may be the spiritual head of a new family in order to colonize the earth. That's what he was to do. You need to leave. Mom and dad, guys. Not only physically, but emotionally, and start your own family as the head of the family, as the spiritual head of the family, in order to colonize the earth. See, a man is to be united with his wife, understanding they are the same flesh, essence. They are mankind. That's why culture is trying to redefine man today into the color of their skin, and not understanding that's not what God did. Man is the same in essence, just like the Godhead. The Godhead is the same. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the same in essence. What's the difference? Function. All three are God. What makes them God? Their essence, who they are. Man and a woman are the same. What makes them humanity? Their essence. Not one is over the other. They're the same, mankind, humanity. The only difference is in function, just like the Godhead. The Father created, the Son redeemed, the Holy Spirit now teaches and guides us. The function is different, but the essence is the same. You've got to understand, men and women are the same essence. Doesn't matter the color of their skin. Doesn't matter size, anything. Mankind is mankind, case, case closed, that's the way God set it up. No certain color line matters more than another colored life. All life matters. Amen? All life, even the one in the womb yet to be born, matters. Because God created it. See, if you don't understand the original purpose, then what happens down the road? It gets all messed up like we're dealing with in society today. Because people don't understand what it was all about. We went through that in this country where women couldn't even vote. We still see that overseas now in the Middle East. Women are considered slaves and servants and all this. That's not the original purpose. A woman and a man are the exact same thing. They just have a different function. And I ain't going to get too graphic at it. You understand the functions are different for procreation. Because he told them to be fruitful and multiply. He blessed them and said, fill the earth. That's why you need a suitable companion. Man, you can't fill the earth on your own. Two guys can't fill the earth on their own. Two women can't fill the earth on their own. Do we get the picture? 
Anytime we want to change and pervert what God's original intent is, we get into a mess. And see, we bought into that mess and we want to try to correct the mess. No, don't try to correct the mess. Go back to the purpose. Go back to the original intent and begin to speak that original intent. And the original intent will come back. You know what? Guys, it's not good to be alone. God designed you to have a companion. So seek a companion. And treat that companion as the same as you, as it says in other scriptures. No man hates his own flesh. The woman is the same flesh. Bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. There is no difference. A man and a woman are to honor their mother and father, but not at the expense of their own family. Their former family is never to cause strife or division in the new family. The former family is to be a godly example of what the new family should look like. In-laws don't become outlaws, will you? You're to be a godly example of the new family that's being birthed with the man and the woman coming together. There's no rousing applause, why? I know, this goes really counterculture now. Can you see how far our culture has drifted from the original intent and purpose of God when he made a woman? We've got to understand that, guys. Leave your mommy and daddy. Be joined to your wife, and it said become one flesh. You treat her the way you ought to be treated because she is bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. And it says, I think it's in Ephesians, I forget, because I didn't write it down. No man hates his own flesh, but nourishes it. Get out of your individuality, two became one. You are not two individuals living together, you are one. Matthew 5, 27 and 28 says this, You have heard the commandment, you must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who looks at a woman and lusts with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So just some thoughts on men and women and what we see and what culture is like. The devil has perverted the original design and intent concerning the relationship between a man and a woman. Guys, God did not create a woman to fulfill your sexual lusts and desires. That's not why women are on the earth. Okay? Another rousing applause. I mean, really? <laughs> Guys, she's not a sex toy. Okay? Stop looking at a woman with lust in your eyes and in your heart. God said if you do that, you've committed adultery. There's a problem if you are married and looking at another woman in that fashion. Amen? Amen? Didn't say you can't look. It's not that you can't look. You're going to naturally look. And today's society makes it hard because a lot is revealed today. Amen? <laughs> go to the beach. <laughs> Just go to the gym. There are people wearing things in the gym they ought not to be wearing. So it's hard not to see. You will see it. And it's hard to unsee some of the things you see. <laughs> But he's saying don't lust after it because when you do, you've already committed adultery because God looks at the heart. The stupid saying that goes around, well, I can look and not touch is of the devil because if you keep looking, you're going to do. How do you know? Been there, done that. I did that. Lusted after another woman and committed adultery. I did it. I'm not proud of it, and I'm not saying it to get an emotional response. I'm saying what he said is true. If you look at another woman and you lust after her, which I did that person for months, guess what ended up happening? The invisible manifested into the physical. It was only by the grace of God. I wasn't even born again then that Mary forgave me and I was able to rebuild that trust and continue our relationship together. 
And again, I just share that so you'll understand what he said is real. I experienced it. God's not a liar. You cannot look at another person in lust and have nothing happen. It will damage your own relationship and you'll end up doing what you lust after. Because a man thinks in his heart, so is he, and he becomes that. Why do you think he got so upset at the Tower of Babel? These people have purposed in their heart to do this thing, they're going to do it. That's why it says if you lust in your heart, you'll end up doing it. Okay, now ladies, chapter. Ladies, please do not use your bodies in an ungodly fashion to gain the love and affection of a man. Don't dress that way. Now I'm not saying you got to dress, you know, dress culturally relevant. Okay? Be nice, dress your age. Okay? <laughs> Some of you got it, know what I was saying. <laughs> dress your age. Okay? Don't think you're in your 20s anymore, guy. You're in your 60s. Okay? Don't go around with the earring and the big gold chain in your head on that, but you look stupid. Okay? Dress your age. Ladies, the same thing. Seven-year-old woman ought not to be wearing a bikini. Okay? No, you cannot see that. Okay? And I'm specifically picturing an image I saw on our first cruise together of a woman in her 70s at least in a bikini laying on. No, no. Dress your age. Don't, don't do that. Okay? But the point is, please, culture says, you must give their body to a man in order to gain his love and affection. Do not do that. You are more valuable than that. That is a devil's perversion of why God created a woman. I think it's gotten bad now. Turn it over to Matthew 19. Now it's going to get real ugly. <laughs> Marriage and divorce. Going to touch on this. We're not going to do a big in-depth thing because, again, relationship between a man and a woman. We got to touch this. It's real, ain't it? <clears throat> I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but how many have been divorced? Just to be publicly on notice, PE has stood up here and said she getting a divorce. I married a divorced woman, so your two pastors are here. And some people, religion is so perverted this and messed it up, and we've got to understand the truth behind it because when you understand the original intent of what God says, then we can properly walk out what He says here, amen? Well, some of you are not too sure. Well, let's put the caveat on the divorce thing. We made divorce okay if you did it before you were saved. So I committed adultery and before I was saved, so that must mean it was okay. It, it's under the blood now. Ain't everything under the blood? You know? Robin got divorced before she was saved, so I guess that makes it okay for me to marry her. But if she didn't, it's not. If she was saved at the time, you know what I mean? See all the things we've put on it? We've got to understand what the Word of God says. <clears throat> so I only want to, I want to address this because it's real personal and relevant right here in this congregation, ain't it? So you guys have been divorced, maybe you've been remarried, in the process, it, it's an ugly thing. And we're going to talk about what it says in Malachi 2. So let's look at it. You ready? You good now? We prep to go through it? Say, Holy Spirit, give me wisdom of what's about to be said because we got to shatter the religious stuff we've been ingrained with. Amen? Yeah. So it starts out in verse 19, um, Matthew 19, verse 1. It says this, When Jesus was finished saying these things, He left Galilee and went to the region of Judea, east of the Jordan River. Large crowds followed Him there, and He healed their sick. Some Pharisees came and tried to trap him with this question. So 
to understand the setting, here comes the Pharisees and they're going to try to trap Jesus. This is the question they bring up. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for any reason? Understand the motive and aim to find out what the Word of God says is to trap him. Right? So that's why the question gets presented. I love the way Jesus responds. Can we start doing this? Haven't you read the scriptures? He answered the question with a question. Because he understood where they were going with it. Haven't you read the scriptures? He's kind of putting it back on them. He says, they recorded that from the beginning, talking about the scriptures, God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Right? Since they are no longer two, but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. And we love to say that at weddings, don't we? But God has joined together right here in this ceremony, and he let no man put asunder. Good old King James language, amen? We'll put an emphasis on it with the good old King James. We even understand what the original intent was. No, we're just going to make our own laws and traditions, which I read this morning in my devotions, Jesus says, makes the word of God of none effect. He goes on and says, Then, why did Moses say in the law? Okay, yeah, God said that, but why did Moses say in the law that a man could give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away, they asked. Jesus replied, God, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts. But that was not what God originally intended. That wasn't God's original intent. What was his original intent? Do you remember? This is really important. The two become one for the purpose of what? Propagating the kingdom on earth. Be fruitful and multiply. Now I'm really going to tweak you back. Robin said I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to, but it's coming to my mind. The first two people, Adam and Eve, were never married. There was no marriage ceremony in the garden, although we like to say the first wedding happened in the garden. Yeah. Uh, no, it didn't. He made a man. He made a woman with an intent purpose. Now, some of you are tweaking bad. I'm not saying marriage is wrong. Okay. Like I said, I've been, you know what I've been doing lately? This is going to shock you. I'm leaving. I have actually lately now sit down with my Bible, the book itself. I've not read the book in a long time. Everything I do is digital, either reading here or listening. I've actually got a Bible again. Actually, it was one of Robin's. I said, "Can I have it?" And I've got colored pencils, and I am literally reading it and coloring it. And I just read about Lamech. You know, Lamech was the first guy that had two wives, right? Did you ever get in trouble by God for that? I didn't see it in there. In fact, he said, I killed the man who hurt me, and, you know, I'm claiming Cain's curse, and I'm doubling it, or seven times in it, whatever he said. Ain't that interesting? You see, all these people in the Old Testament had more than one wife. I don't get no ideas, because then you have to be more, okay? <laughs> Not saying that either. Don't read into what I'm saying. I'm just making an observation and putting it out there and say, can we start using this thing when we read the Word of God? You know what I mean? Can we use our brain and ask God, what was your purpose behind that? Your purpose of making a woman was to make a suitable partner for the purpose of propagating the earth because it's not good that man alone, because man can't do it alone. No with another man. So understand the purpose. You are a suitable companion for me for the purpose of walking out a godly culture for the propagation of the kingdom and reproducing the kingdom. 
through our marriage relationship is going to reflect the marriage relationship between the body of Christ and Christ. That's what we're reflecting. And we need to work that out in a practical sense, guys. We really do. And when me and Barbara get married, what did I say? We are going to be a godly example to you of what a married couple will look like. That's our intent. Because this is his intent. That's God's original design. He said, see, Moses gave you divorce because of the hardness of your heart. But that wasn't God's original intent. He says, and I tell you this, whoever divorces his wife and marries another, or else uh, or marries someone else, commits adultery. So some could say, yeah, I committed adultery. I married a divorced woman. Unless his wife's been unfaithful. Can I tell you something about that phrase too? Being unfaithful is not a get out of jail free card because some people think marriage is a jail. I've known women who've done this actually withheld themselves, created such a toxic environment in the house that they actually drove their husband out, committed adultery, and then justified their behavior to divorce them. That's not what this is saying. Because in Malachi 2.16 it says, The God, God of Israel says, I hate divorce. I hate the person who, or the one who hates and divorces, does a cruel thing as easily as he puts on his clothes. See, the person who's intent on divorce, the person who's intent on creating that environment is creating violence. And that's what God hates. He didn't say, I hate divorce. I hate the person's attitude that's creating that environment because that was my intent. I gave you a perfect companion. Now, the other stupid thing that religion has said, can you tell I'm getting a little crank now? They want women to stay in a toxic environment with an idiot guy that abuses and misuses and even beats her. Yes. That is stupid. That's not what he's saying. Amen. He says, I hate the person whose heart is bent on destroying this relationship no matter how it is. Physical abuse, emotional abuse. That's the person, not the one that's getting divorced, not the one that finally has had enough and steps out because so many ladies have been beaten down by that. Again, if we don't understand his original purpose and intent, all this perversion happens and religion has been good at perverting this topic back. Let's end on a good note. Is that okay? <laughs> First Corinthians seven fifteen. You ought to read First Corinthians seven, the whole thing. I've only took out fifteen. It says this: If the unbelieving spouse decides the marriage is over, let them go or her go. The believing partner is free from the mar marital vows because God has called you to peace. Let him go. The person wants to go, let him go. See, and this is where religion has stepped in. Oh, both of you were saved. So you can't let him go because it says the unbeliever. How do you know the person's really even saved? One. Because two, obviously their behavior is not the saved person. Some people have been pretty perverted and deviant in their behavior. It would make you question whether they were truly born again. But we don't even got to go there. You know what? If the person wants to go, God said, let them go. Because I've called you peace. You're my kid. I want you living in peace. No, divorce ain't the worst crime that's ever happened on the face of the earth. Divorce is part of man's fall, rebellion, and religion has perverted it and twisted it so bad and has wrecked men's lives and women's lives. That was not God's original intent. We've got to understand that. 
when we run into somebody that's divorced or going through a divorce, don't look at them circumspectly like that. You pray for them, encourage them, and come alongside them. And don't try to keep them in a relationship that's obviously messed up and whacked out. You don't know what it's like, in a sense, unless you've been there. Know what I mean? You don't know what the person's going through. God's called us all to live in peace. He doesn't hate the one that's hands been forced to finally break the tie. Because guys are good at that. Guys are good at forcing their wives to do the things that they didn't want to do because they were the idiots. And we're just going to stay in this thing. We're going to force the hand. And then all of a sudden it comes up. Oh, you filed for divorce? Who cares who filed? Is this making sense? Are we understanding the relationship? We've got to go back to the beginning. Two became one for a specific purpose. To propagate and fill the earth because man couldn't do it alone. Now the reality is, a lot of us got messed up in relationships, we got messed up in all this stuff, and you know what God says? And again, that's not a get out of marriage free card either. Oh, the person wants to go, I'm going to let him go. No, you do everything is possibly possible to keep that relationship together, but you've got to come to the place and understand it may not ever work. That doesn't mean stay there. doesn't mean stay there. A lot of the problem is, and I'll just end with this, is people don't even understand the specific purpose and intent at the beginning. A lot of us probably got married when we weren't saved and didn't understand any of this stuff. But you can't force an individual to follow practices they don't want to follow. That's why God said, let them go. Every man has free will. Every woman has free will. And you know what? Everyone's going to stand before God and give an account of their own life. You know what I mean? So again, we just want to understand things. Why did God create woman? To be a helpmeet to man. So that they can colonize the earth. Be that reflection of what the marriage in heaven is going to be. Now the reality is, that does not always work out. So God doesn't hate the one that got divorced. God hates the one that's creating the violence and causing the division. That's why it said, God made them two and let no man pull them asunder. Let no man split them. Husband, don't split it. Wife, don't split it. Right? But what do you do if a husband or a wife is split? You work it out. And if you get to a place where you can't work it out, praise God, I worked it out. And we weren't even Christians then when we worked it out. Is it possible? Yeah. But you may come to a place where it ain't possible. And let the unbelieving spouse go because God has called you to peace. It's got to be a personal thing between you and God. And please, body, don't you ever judge that on somebody else. Don't ever do it. We're kingdom kids. We walk in love, mercy, and grace and forgiveness just like he does. But we to point a finger at something. Who do we to say you can't be a pastor because you've been divorced? Or to say you can't be a pastor because you married someone who's divorced? Or you can't be a pastor because you got divorced? Or you can't be a deacon because you got divorced? Man has put all this stuff on there. Am I saying we don't walk in wisdom? I'm not saying that. You sit down and talk to people and find out where they were really at, what the situations were really about. You know what I mean? There's a natural component. You have wisdom. But again, nowhere in there does it say divorce qualifies anyone from the kingdom. Amen? It says liars won't get in, but we got no problem with that. Liars will not inherit the kingdom of God. It doesn't say those who are divorced won't inherit, but, you know, we've flipped that around. Make sense? Hopefully it wasn't too heavy this morning. But it has to get said, amen? The truth's got to come out. God created women to be a suitable partner for a man, not a helpmeet, not to be subordinate, 
not all that junk we've been taught, not all the junk culture has taught us. And then if that relationship don't work out, the greatest sin on earth is not divorce. We've got to come from God's perspective, amen? It's the traditions of men that are making the Word of God of none effect. That's why everything's been messed up. Amen? I think I'll shut up now. How's that? <laughs> I think we're good. Please, get that visual of that 70-year-old woman in a bikini out of your mind. Just throw that away. Because that was nasty. That was nasty. All right. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we love you. And Father, I'll admit to you, sometimes we... It's hard to break off traditions. It's hard to truly grasp what you're really saying. But Lord, you said you've given us the Holy Spirit to teach us the truth. You said we have the mind of Christ and you will use that mind to guide us into all truth. So Father, as I said earlier this morning, Lord, we give you our heart. We give you our belief system. Shatter it right now in Jesus' name. And Father, fill it with your original intent on why you did what you did. And then Lord, we give you our soul. Because that needs to be reprogrammed bad. We need to think different. We need to feel different. We need to act different. So Lord, this morning we present ourselves to you as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you. And I pray this morning our worship has been acceptable. And as we walk from this place, we will get into the book for ourselves. Look at it through a kingdom eye mindset. And have you redevelop us and retrain us and truly conform us into the religion, not religion anymore, because we've been conformed into a religious image of Christ. And Lord, we want to be conformed into the true image of Christ. Lord, we love you, worship you, and praise you, and we go from this place encouraged, maybe challenged, maybe whatever. But Lord, I'm just trusting you will take the words that have been spoken, they won't return void, but they'll accomplish in the hearts what you want them to do. We love you and praise you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Be blessed.